Imagine having a positive impact on the brains of a billion people, asks Health Tech Connect's president and chief scientific officer, Dr. Ryan Darcy. He goes on to say, that is our bold vision. The company develops transformative innovations in brain health. One such instrument is the NeuroCatch platform, the world's first deployable, objective, and rapid measuring tool of brain function. The data collected from the NeuroCatch device is shared with the Center for Neurology Studies, which is generating quality evidence and mobilizing groundbreaking neurological assessments and treatments for use at the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic. All of these medical and life sciences facilities are part of an expanding community of leading edge research and biomedical companies in Surrey. The growth of life sciences and biomedical companies in the lower mainland of British Columbia is extraordinary and in fact it's turning the region into an internationally recognized center of excellence. The sector con includes more than 2,000 companies employing more than 18,000 people and it's an industry valued in the billions of dollars. It's expanded by more than 13% over the last four years and it continues to attract international talent and investment. I invited Dr. Ryan Darcy to join me for a conversation that matters about his work, why you should care, what it means to you and your brain health, and what needs to be done to ensure that this sector continues to develop here in British Columbia. Dr. Darcy, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. How is it that we are in British Columbia uh, surging forward in the development of innovative uh, neurological uh, testing and studies that are producing like usable on the ground results? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. We weren't always. Uh, historically, Canada has been very strong in neuroscience and over the last 20 years there's been a push to to make that more translational. And I think that BC's strengths, uh, as, as far, let's say 10 years ago, they really started to um, catch up. They were not uh, at the top of the country. There were, uh, you know, provinces like Ontario, for example, uh, Nova Scotia and Halifax were very, very much leading the way. Um, Alberta would be another example. and. It was largely an initiative, uh, kind of an organic initiative, uh, 10 years ago to try to start to change that, to bring in innovation and to bring in translation so that a lot of the major uh, breakthroughs that you find in science laboratories were making their way to where we needed our care. And that's, that's happened quite rapidly and it's been a very exciting thing to be a part of over the last 10 years. So was that what uh, made, well, ensured that you stayed here working with SFU and then doing your work to build out what is now becoming part of a very important uh, center of excellence around uh, brain research? Yeah, yeah. If you can imagine, when I, I came back to the province, I was so excited to get back to my home. And I ended up landing in Surrey, which was, as many people thought, was just not a place that you would find something like this. <laughs> and what we saw was this incredible greenfield opportunity to build a translational uh, cluster called the Health and Technology District and make it a global leading uh, innovation uh, sort of center. And at the tip of that spear, for sure, uh, was our brain imaging technologies and, and advances in treatments and therapies. So tell me about the NeuroCatch device, like what was the genesis of that coming together and then how does it work? For sure. NeuroCatch was born out of a frustration actually. Uh, it, it, we have capabilities in our advanced brain imaging labs that are like science fiction level. Uh, it, it's incredible how powerful we can peer non-invasively into your brain and watch your brain in action. Uh, with these super and just amazing technologies and they exist in advanced laboratories and universities and hospitals around the world and the world is pushing forward all this knowledge of how our brains work but the frustration was that none of that was getting beyond the the university and the ivory towers and none of it was was solving a long-standing problem where the way that we actually evaluate how your brain works and then hopefully find treatments 
hadn't really changed that much in, in 30 or 40 years. And so there was this frustration that we had to find, I personally uh, wanted to see this get out in the world. Um, not only a scientist, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a, a, you know, a, I'm a passionate Canadian and I thought it just wasn't acceptable to see a technology that we knew could make a difference in objectively measuring how your brain was in being sensitive to changes in your highest level prized cognitive skills um, just reside in, in academic laboratories. So we started on the mission to develop a brain scanner that's portable and deployable called NeuroCatch. And how NeuroCatch works, it's, um, it's accessible, so it's rapid. It's like a blood pressure cuff. We actually modeled it uh, off of uh, what, if we can do this for the heart, can we do it for the brain? And it is, uh, it, it takes it, it operates in minutes. We've deployed it to a number of different places where you would require care, be it hospitals or clinics, but also actually we've had it in the pontoons of float planes and helicopters and care homes, uh, hockey arenas, uh, football, field sides, uh, you name it. Uh, so it, it's, um, it's allowed us to bring the advances that we would find in our uh, incredibly sophisticated laboratories to the front lines of care. So what's it look like? How do you, you know, put it into, in, into service when dealing with somebody? For sure. It, NeuroCatch uh, comes in a small box. It is a cap you put on your head with sensors that record your brain activity. Uh, there are only uh, a small number of sensors and we put a little bit of gel in so that the sensors can record without ever having to poke or prod you your brain activity uh, from the surface of your scalp. And then what we do is we actually uh, actually stimulate your brain. So we, we, you will hear noises, uh, uh, beeps or tones and words. And what we can do is, is actually stimulate responses we know uh, and record them from these sensors, record your brain activity, and then measure to see if you have the, uh, your brain activity fits within healthy, normal cognitive ranges. And it does that all in six minutes. Uh, so it's automated and very rapid. So are you measuring all parts of the brain? Because, you know, we have prefrontal cortex, you have the left and right hemispheres, the occipital lobe, and so on. Like, how is it that you're able to stimulate all of those regions and be able to gather that much information so quickly? Yeah, so to use a, a computer analogy, you can ping the system, which is what we do. So we, we ping your nervous system and your nervous system when it's, it, if you imagine it like um, an incredibly complex computer, in order to perform your thinking and your cognition, it requires your whole brain to act in, in a symphony, a, a synchrony, so to speak. And that creates these brain waves. And so when we ping the system and then we have sensors just placed on the top of your head, we can actually record those and make sure that the system is working according to as it should be. And it's really in that way that simple. What does a normally functioning, uh, you know, healthy brain look like when you get this data? Like, what are you looking at? Is it a chart? Is it an image? Are you seeing electrical currents? Uh, how do you start to decipher what has been measured? So that's what's really interesting. This capability has been around for a long time. Um, for almost coming up 100 years, we've known how to record your brain's electrical activity. And we've known how to actually probe and understand how your brain processes things. So back again to the, the analogy of your brain being a supercomputer, which it is. It's the world's greatest supercomputer. We, um, what we did is we took... The, the way to ping it so that we could get a record of your brain processing uh, information as it goes from low level sensory processing, so if you hear something, to higher level attention. So if you're walking in the woods and, a, and you hear a stick snap, you, you're gonna turn and orient because it's either a stick snapping because someone stepped on it or it's a bear, right? So, so we, we actually probe that response and then at a higher level, as you're listening to the words I'm, I'm saying now, your brain has responses to those as well, and we probe for that response. So we get three key responses, an auditory sens sensory response, your basic attention, and then your cognitive processing. And with those three responses, we 
quite literally just measure the size and the timing of them to create a normal map of what that should look like. And then when we get your brain waves, we, we compare yours against the normal map. So much like when you get blood pressure and you, you know 120 over 80 is normal, now you can come in and say, okay, I'd like to see how my brain's responses match with what is normal. So let's say you feel that you have a normal, healthy cognitive function, but you're going, okay, is there any chance that I might be experiencing early signs of dementia? Are you able to start to determine whether or not there is some deterioration there that uh, can be identified early on? Yes, that's, that's one of the strong uh, powers and advantages of, of this and recording objectively your brain waves. We're mm -hmm. so sensitive to subtle changes mm -hmm. in your thinking that we can tell the difference in young people's cognition versus people who are older uh, age. And we know that as we age, one of the things that happens is our cognitive abilities, they slow slightly. Um, and we can actually detect that difference. So right now, uh, just before doing this podcast, we were finishing uh, uh, one of our recent scientific studies looking at people who are in care homes with dementia versus those that didn't have dementia. And those differences on, on the NeuroCatch are very, very large and very noticeable. So let's say you identify early uh, that somebody is in those early stages of dementia. What's the benefit of having that information that can help them hopefully slow down that process uh, and have a better quality of life? Excellent question. So in, uh, in medicine, one very well-known axiom is that you can't treat what you can't measure. So we really focused on solving this measurement problem. Can we have an objective and sensitive measure of how your brain is doing? What that does is that immediately has healthcare benefits at a larger level. So in, in sort of clinical studies and clinical trials, it means that we can, ha we can start to find uh, drug treatments and other treatments that work. But at our individual level, it also means that we can measure what treatments are working for us. So again, if you go back to the comparison to blood pressure, if I come into the doctor and I'm worried about my cardiovascular health, one of the very first things that happens is they'll take my blood pressure. And if my blood pressure comes out high, I know what 120 over 80 is. And if it comes out at 160 over 80, um, we might start looking and saying, okay, well, let's measure that. Let's make sure, you know, how's the salt in your diet? How's your stress? Um, are you getting enough exercise? And if I start to do those things and I see that now my, when I measure again, my result is in 120 over 80, I know I'm treating my cardiovascular health. And effectively, NeuroCatch works exactly the same way. We can find now treatments that help people. Hmm. So in my introduction, I, I talked about the fact that you also share this uh, data with the Center for Neuroplasticity. And if we take a look at what we're uh, truly understanding now about the neuroplasticity of the brain, if let's say you have a patient that comes in that suffered a stroke or had trauma to the brain and there is you know, a loss of function, does do you start by measuring and the NeuroCatch gives you a baseline that you then can start to measure against how effective the treatments are? Yes, we do do that. One of the greatest and most rewarding parts of what we do here is, and I think this is true to say we're unique in this way in the, in the world. And by that, what I mean is we have top leading centers like the Mayo Clinics and the Cornells sending patients to us, right? Um, because we have the capability to take people with a brain injury or a brain disease and, and make a difference where nowhere else uh, could they find that capability. And you alluded to exactly how we do it. We will measure you, we, not just with a neural catch, but we'll measure a number of different aspects of how your brain is today. We will then um, look at the leading new innovations in therapies and treatments that we've particularly put through clinical trials so we know they work. And where they, we can apply them to your situation, we will implement them in our clinic. And then every week um, on, a, on a daily and weekly basis, 
We see people who were thought that they had a chronic brain condition and that was what they had to live for, for the rest of their life. And we are changing that story in many, many cases. So it's incredibly rewarding. Recently, I uh, conducted an interview with uh, Dr. Doug Clement. Uh, you may know him from UBC uh, um, Sports Medicine Clinic and the Harry Jerome mm -hmm. Classic and the Vancouver Sun Run and so on. When he, he was in his mid-60s, no matter, it didn't matter, unfortunately, that he was as healthy as he was, he had a massive stroke. And at, this is going back some 20-odd years ago. And, and he said, in his mind, even though he didn't have the evidence then, uh, he believed that he could uh, change the final prognosis of what the, the trauma to his brain was. And he almost independently taught himself how to walk and talk and like mm -hmm. uh, reestablish his life. To have these kinds of resources now makes a big difference. And, and what he points out is we're now proving that just because you've had a stroke or you've had trauma doesn't mean that the brain cannot find another way to perform the functions that are so vital to being able to have a good life. Yes, yeah, that's that's a really interesting um, emerging area that I would want viewers to know about. When I was trained as a neuroscientist, and I actually, a, lo a large part of my training was in stroke rehabilitation in the hospitals, uh, the concept that your brain uh, it would it your brain would develop as you were growing from uh, sort of birth to into your 20s but then what was taught was that after that place it got fixed and in the research laboratories they were looking at this concept of neuroplasticity which is basically a fancy science word for your brain's ability to innately rewire new circuits and regain abilities and if you think about it just a little bit that has to be true because we can learn throughout our life. So every time we're learning, we're rewiring a new circuit. And that's, neuro, that's a form of neuroplasticity. But what's happened and what's happening now is that we are understanding that there's this incredible power that lies within all of our brains um, to rewire uh, our, our lost abilities through neuroplasticity. And that's being applied in stroke and in brain injury and in a host of different neurologic diseases and, and injuries. Uh, it, it's resided with us the whole time. But what we're, I think you could almost, I feel like we're grabbing the tiger by the tail now because we're learning how to harness that power and how to change what's happened to you in a positive way. So the average viewer is going to say, okay, well, that sounds great. I keep hearing about all these kinds of advances. Isn't it fantastic that, uh, you know, the southwest corner of British Columbia is moving forward? How do I get access to this? Or is this just, you know, once again, something that is available on a research basis? Or is this actually available now? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, and it's a very common sentiment. When we see things come out, be it on the news or whatever, you know, your immediate thought is, okay, well, that's awesome, but when, when is that ever going to come into the world? That's actually what we're focused at doing here in, our, in Surrey in the Health and Technology District, is that translating this to immediate benefit. That is our mission and our, our ethos. So uh, what we do to create access is we first develop innovative technologies like NeuroCatch. We then actually find, use our, our measuring system to find the most innovative treatments on the planet. And often they will uh, want to come here and do clinical trials. So we will curate them, we'll, we'll do studies and make sure they are what they say they are. And when that's, uh, let's say that you get access to the clinical trial, but not all people do. So to expand on access, what we have done is we've created a clinic called the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic, which actually provides um, the access to these things. Um, from there, we actually uh, expand it further and have a network of collaborators and partners and clinics that's expanding not just in BC and across Canada, but across the United States and, and further um, to provide um, greater access. Um, that For any given technology or intervention, that's always at a different stage. Uh, but there are many, many cases right now where people are coming to find us here uh, to get access to these things uh, sooner than they'll make it out in the world. And um, that's a really rewarding part of what we do. We, we are not one of these stories that, okay, I'll never see it. We're the opposite. Um, it's here. It's helping. Um, it does that on a daily basis. So how accessible 
is it then in Surrey? Like, how does somebody, I literally say, how does somebody get there? Because I'm sure that there are going to be people who are going to say, okay, I want that. I know that I'm one of them. I go, I want you to try that because one of my concerns in life is I want to make sure that I maintain uh, the best possible cognitive function for as long as possible. And I, you know, when I asked Dr. Max Sinatter how to do that, he said, well, die young. And I don't, that's not the, that's not the outcome that I want. I'd like to be able to come and have access to these kinds of uh, instruments and, and know what I can do. Yeah, for, uh, so certainly I would say it's as simple as having access to a computer and being able to Google the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic uh, and reach out to them. And, and they are in place to do exactly that, provide an access portal to all the things we do here. And, and it's absolutely the case that I always uh, am more than interested to talk to people and to help along the way. And if you get to the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic, you get to me. So, um, so I think that's uh, the, the short answer to the question is, is start there. What else needs to be done to ensure that you have the resources that you need to be able to expand this work, to make Surrey and, you know, southwestern British Columbia the true center of excellence? I mean, you're already starting to attract that attention, but are there other resources that you need to be able to expand on the quality and the uh, scope of your work? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll answer that in terms of our mandate to try, to positively impact a billion people. Um, so that when when you're trying to change the world, you have to set yourself scary goals. And that certainly um, in the earliest days was a scary goal. It's not so scary to us anymore because we're seeing the rate of expansion um, and uptake be uh, quite quick and, and encouraging. I think the two things that I would say we need um, because we're in a scaling up place is increased awareness, just like the show we're doing right now. This is valuable. More often than not, what we hear is people didn't even realize that was an option or people didn't even realize this was all in Surrey, right? So, so it's really valuable that more and more people are aware of what's out there um, that can help them. And that's, that's definitely one thing. Then the other part of what we're doing is we, and this is an interesting aspect, Many people, I think, expect that this happens in our universities and our hospitals, but our public system is not built really to do these sorts of things. Uh, our hospitals are, as we all know, in COVID times are overloaded. Our universities are really focused on studying problems. They're not necessarily in a position of, of devising the, pro the solutions for those problems. They're experts at understanding them. Uh, what what we do here is we we use the the power of business um, in terms of creating new innovative products and services to drive these models forward such that they can make it back to our hospitals and our universities and so the other key thing that we work for is getting more mechanisms of supporting novel innovative healthcare uh, options so our third party payers our insurers and those sorts of things are really valuable because we're starting to provide evidence that suggests if you're on long-term disability, for example, we can change that. And our taxpayers don't have to have a lifelong burden or you don't have to have a lifelong burden. And so the evidence coming out of here, getting connected with the, the systems that can help create better access is also critical. Well, I encourage people to look you up to go uh, find out more. I think that what you're doing is extraordinary. I've been out there to Surrey, and it's impressive. As you say, people don't even know that it's there. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join me today and you know, bring us up to speed on not just your work, but the impact that it's having on British Columbia. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This was just really great. Thank you. You know, I, I, was, I wasn't going to add this in, but, but I got thinking about it. I, I went, okay, so Rick Hansen's from Williams Lake, and through his work, he's attracted so much research into spinal cord research, and you're from Williams Lake, and you're, you know, becoming this magnetic center around uh, neuroscience. So what is it yeah. that's in the water in Williams Lake? <laughs> it's, it's not the first time we've joked and asked about the question. Um, there's a number of, we've discovered... Uh, some other major innovators, Rowena Rosati, who is part of this and a major mover and shaker, also born in Williams Lake. Um, oh, so, so, yeah. yeah. So Billy's Puddle has uh, has a bit of a legacy to the province. Yeah.
<laughs> what did you call it? Whose puddle? Billy's puddle. Billy's puddle. Oh, that's good. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well. If you've grown up in it, you you can you know I've got a collection. I I, I love Williams Lake. It's uh it's uh, yeah. part of uh, definitely my history. But uh, yeah, I've got some fun stories about the uh, growing up in Williams Lake. One of the other things that I, I like is you, like Mark O'Mara, who's owed a BC Cancer, had, was from here, educated here, went away, came back. Uh, but it's only because of the change in the landscape here, um, seeing this growing community of excellence. And I, and I think that we need to celebrate what we're doing here in BC far more than we do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Part of the challenge with BC is it... Um, it's got, I've, I've been quoted as talking about, it, it sort of competes too much within rather than recognizing that it has a, uh, that, it, that the bigger and larger competition is, is globally and beyond yep. our boundaries. Yeah. And, and I think that um, the, the concept of really uh, lifting ourselves up is a critical one. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I also think about the work that uh, Alan Eves has done down in stem cell technologies, and he has, you know, this vision. And yet, I know that there are people who ask ah, stem cell, everything stem cell. But like, let's not let, let's celebrate him and what he's doing because yes. he's helping to attract a tremendous talent and innovation that's going to come to the area and will continue to grow. Yeah, my yeah. my hypothesis is that it's um. It's a misperception or a misconception around the scarcity of, of resources. Yeah. So I think that basically the, the competition comes in the, in the fear that if somebody else is doing well, it means you won't get resources. Right. And rather than thinking about the concept of that resources don't have to just be what's available in our province, it can be our country, our, our you know, the greater North America. And, mm -hmm. and when you start to then take the strengths in this province and partner them or support them, and there are many great examples. Uh, Abcellar is another one, right? There's, yeah. there's some incredibly massive powerhouse stuff coming out of this province. And when, yeah. it, would, when it starts to actually sort of converge and, and coordinate, I think that's when you would not have to be worried about resources because we'll drive our economies and we'll drive success for each other. I, I'll sort of wrap up by telling you I'm, I'm always, uh, I guess, motivated when I, when I recall a, a quote from Aristotle uh, who said, it's the responsibility of each of us to realize our full potential because a failure to do so is a loss to all of society. I love that quote. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. I love that quote. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Hope to meet you someday in person. And uh, Definitely. Yeah, yeah, this was fun. Thanks so much, Stuart.